I'm not ex exactly sure when it all started, this crazy love affair that I have with Autumn. Is there anyone else that shares that fall love fest with me? It's my favorite time of year. I think it may have, had, may have something to do with an old wooden wagon in an Iowa cornfield. It was really a bit of a ritual for us farm kids growing up, a coming to age for us guys. You see, in our house, 14 was the magic age. That was the age when we got to carry a loaded gun on the annual pheasant hunt. That was the, the age when Dad would let us skip school on the last Wednesday in September to go to the Iowa Farm Progress Show. And that was also the age when Dad would pour us our very first cup of coffee. And we were, we were able to participate in that hallowed Dutch tradition of coffee time. The Jews have their barvitska, Dutchmen have coffee time, see? And, and there, there was a coming of age for us, but the real sign of manhood at our place was when Dad would pour us that cup of coffee. Mom was able to hold us off the substance for 14 years, but when that magic birthday came, we truly became one of the guys. But there was something Mom didn't know. You see, on those on those uh, cool, crisp October mornings and those frigid November days uh, when Dad would keep us home from school to help with the harvest, he'd pack an extra cup for us, <laughs> even though we were only 11 or 12 or 13. And, and there's, a, there's a kind of a magic that happens this time of year. You see, at 9.30 in the morning, we'd climb into an empty wagon, soon to be filled to the brim with ears of corn. We'd wrap our cold hands around a hot mug of coffee, and inside that, inside that uh, wagon, though the wind would be howling above us, snow flurries going around our heads, we were warm, we were blessed, and we were safe. And I think that an empty barge box, the wonder of harvest, was born forever in the mind and the heart of an Iowa farm kid. A half century has come and gone since those days, or nearly a half century, and the wonder of harvest has never waned. I went off to college for a few years, uh, worked in a factory a time or two, but every year about September, something would kick in. The crispness of the air would trigger an urgency. It's time. It's time to harvest. Time to put every other job on hold to focus on the fields of grain. I, I had a grammar teacher in 10th grade. Her name was Mrs. Blackford, and we affectionately called her Mrs. Blackbeard uh, because... She, she had three strategically uh, located black whiskers <laughs> on her chin, and, and she was a great grammar teacher. I think that she's deceased. I'm sure that the law of average was, would say that she is because she was about 95 when she was teaching us back then, I'm pretty sure. But at any rate, great grammar teacher, but she, she could never figure out why I couldn't stay awake in the 8 o'clock uh, class in the mornings. And she just didn't have an appreciation for harvest. She couldn't understand why Dad would keep us up all night. See, what would happen in the muddy falls, uh, you couldn't pick corn during the day because the tractor would sink in the mud. We didn't have all the flotation devices that the combines have now and, and had an old mounted picker on an old tractor, and we'd plow through the mud. And, and so what Dad would do, he would just work other things during the day, and at night about 9 o'clock when the sun would set and it would start getting cold, and the ground would freeze, and we would go out, and we'd work all night and pick corn till time to milk the cows and go to school in the morning. And I'd drag into my sophomore class uh, grammar, <laughs> such an exciting class. She'd probably be turning over in her grave if she saw me up here standing in front of people and speaking. Because <laughs> all she knew I could do in her class was sleep. She didn't understand. She didn't appreciate the value of harvest and why everything, nothing else mattered except getting the crop in. Last Sunday, Kevin and Tom both talked about the harvest beginning in the book of Acts. The day of Pentecost had come in Acts chapter 2, and God's Spirit was poured upon the church, and the harvest began. And today, we're going to talk about the harvest accelerating, the harvest intensifying, and we're going to be looking in Acts, the third chapter, uh, and we're going to look at the mess, the moment, the miracle, and the message of Acts chapter 3. If there's Bibles at the back, if you'd like to help yourself to those, and uh, we'll be looking together at Acts 3. The harvest accelerates. Pastor Kevin has figured out that the, the growth of the church during the early church years was about 130 converts a day. And uh, the title of his message for today is 130 converts a day can shake a city. 
And we're going to talk about that today, but I want us to read in, in uh, Acts chapter 3, the first uh, seven verses. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with him into the temple courts, walking and leaping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word today. This man and his condition was a mess. And what I would like for us to do today is for us as a church to picture this beggar. And instead of thinking of a physical condition, I want us to think about the world and the culture in which we live and see if there are any analogies, any comparisons that we could draw between this blind beggar and, or this lame beggar and the world that we live in today. Is it possible to say that this world today has been blinded, has been lame, has been crippled because of a condition from birth? If we could have our first slide there, the mess that this man was in, it was a hopeless condition. He had resorted to begging for a living. That was the only way that he could bring home the bacon. He was, he was in this hopeless condition from birth. He had never known what it was to walk and leap and praise God. He had never known what it was to run with his friends at school to play tag and freeze tag and hide and seek and all those things. He had never had any of that. He was a beggar. And every day he went to the same place just to ask for money. And that was his existence. I wonder if we could picture our culture and our, our land today as being somewhat the same. Where we have been crippled from birth because of sin. And we aimlessly walk around looking for purpose in life. We, uh, we're always searching for something deeper than what we've experienced because we're crippled and we're broken from birth. And it's a hopeless condition. I, I've been a lot of places in the last several years and... And uh, one of the places that sticks out in my mind was where I worked in the oil fields in Williston. I know I've talked about that often, but the darkness of the world is just incredible. Maybe it's in your high school. Maybe it's at your place of employment where, where it just seems so dark and so hopeless. I could, describe, I could describe our culture this way. Wrong is right. Right is wrong. Life is lived in the moment without regard for the fear of the Almighty or for the living, breathing Word of God. Little respect for God's Word in today's culture. Watch TV for, a, for just a short time, and you know what I'm talking about. It's a culture of disrespectful and ungrateful kids living in homes of stressed-out moms and deadbeat dads. It's a hopeless place, damaged by the fall, born into sin. It's a mess that we live in. Now... Kevin talked last week about the city of Pella and how hundreds of thousands or 100,000 or so come to here during tulip time and how what it would be like if, if uh, on, like on the day of Pentecost when hundreds of thousands from all over the world came into town and God poured out his spirit. He said, what, what would it be like if, if God poured out his spirit during tulip time when all of these people and then they went back home? Or maybe they even stayed like they did in the book of Acts where hundreds of thousands stayed right in Jerusalem to, uh, because of the outpouring of Pentecost. The church was the center of activity in Jerusalem in those days. They were the place that was going on. In fact, in one place later on, it says those that have turned the world upside down have come here as well. The Holy Spirit was poured out. It was revival everywhere. And if I could compare that, even the numbers are fairly similar as, as Kevin was talking about Pella, Iowa, and the people coming in and sensing revival. And we believe, the leadership of this church believes strongly that God is going to pour out His Spirit in these last days on this little town of Pella. We're excited about it, but the, the real truth is the world is a mess. And as Kevin was talking about the 100,000 that come to Pella, 
my mind went to Williston, where a town of about 15,000, the same as Pella, and 150,000 had converged to work in the oil fields and stayed there for about 10 years. And if you could figure, uh, think about a town of 150,000 with one Walmart and two grocery stores, <laughs> it was a crazy place, and it was a dark place, as I mentioned earlier. The sin was rampant. Uh, I remember uh, reading a statistic that prostitution uh, per capita was highest in Williston, North Dakota of any place in the United States during those years of the boom. And most of it was male-on-male prostitution. That was the darkness of the day. The men outnumbered the ladies 30 to 1 in, in Williston. And so you can just imagine, you kind of feel you can, uh, what it was like, the darkness of the world. And they were a mess. We are a mess. Our culture is a mess. Like I said earlier, wrong is right, right is wrong. We're confused. And that was the condition we find ourselves in the first three verses of Acts chapter 3. But then there was a moment in verse, verses 4 to 7. And I love this story. When Peter and John were about to enter the house, the house of prayer, the beggar stopped them and he asked them for money. Now, what do you do? Let's be honest for a minute. When you're driving down at the intersection and you see the stoplight coming up and you see someone along the side of the road, you're hoping the light doesn't turn red, right? Because you don't, you don't want to... And when, and when you get there, you kind of look the other way and pretend like they aren't there. Anybody else ever done that? Okay. I love Peter's response to this beggar. He didn't look the other way. He didn't pretend it didn't exist. It says he looked straight at him. Are you willing, as Tom mentioned last week, are we, he asked several questions throughout the message. Are we willing to go here? to the book of Acts because it's still being written. Are we willing to go to the place where we're willing to engage the people around us in their hopelessness, in their mess, realizing that it, but for the grace of God, we're in the same mess that they are? Are we willing to look straight at our culture, engage them, and give them this hope? Peter looked straight at him as did John, and Peter said, look at us. Look here, beggar. Look at us. And so he fastened his gaze on him, thinking this was his payday. He was going to get money. And and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. We used to sing a little chorus in the old Pentecostal churches about that. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There was a story about a group of people who were touring one of the great cathedrals in Europe. and, And it was ornately adorned with gold and silver. It was a beautiful, beautiful cathedral. And the guide was taking the people around and he said to the crowd, he says, in this day, we can no longer say silver and gold have I none. As they looked around at the gold and the silver and an old guy in the back of the room says, yeah, neither can we say rise up and walk. You know, there's a moment that we need to have, a moment of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit empowers us to engage the person in front of us to the people around us who are lost in sin and give them hope and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we have hope, we have victory, we have healing, we have wholeness. That is who we are. We need to seize those moments. Now, I, in this story, Peter was the main character, and if we think of him 50 days earlier, you know what he was doing? I don't know that man. Never seen him before in all my life. In fact, he began to curse and to swear, saying, I don't know that man. But Pentecost made this moment powerful. When the Holy Spirit came upon Peter, he was able to look at him and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He went from denial to engagement, from looking the other way to engaging to rushing in and looking straight at culture head on and saying, I know a Jesus, the man that I didn't know 50 days ago because of Pentecost, I know the answer to your need. They didn't give the beggar what he wanted, but they sure gave him what he needed. And that's what we've been called to do, to move from denial to engagement, to move from apathy to authority. I'm going to challenge you at the end of the message today to begin to operate in the authority that we have as believers. And we have not scratched the surface of what God has called us to do. It's sad to say, but we we walk around a lot of time like 
like a stepchild instead of the son and the, <laughs> of the living God. We fail to realize the authority that has been granted to us. There's a story in, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 8, and I won't take time to read it, but you're familiar with it. It's the story of the four men who brought the man to Jesus and uh, the paralytic. And Matthew doesn't tell about how they let him down through the roof, but in Luke, they, he does. But uh, they bring this man to Jesus, and Jesus says, okay, your sins are forgiven. And everybody says, oh, no one can forgive sins except God alone. And then Jesus said he knew what they were thinking. And uh, it would have been kind of, <laughs> I'd have been freaked out if I'd have been <laughs> in those days when Jesus could just look right at you and know exactly what you were thinking. By the way, he still does. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said, which is easier, to say, this, to say forgive this man's sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? And then he said, so that you will know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said, take up your mat and walk and go home. And the guy jumped up and went on his way. It's a very parallel story to this one right here. But there's a neat little segment in the end of that that I had never seen before. Deb and I have been going through Matthew in our devotional times and uh, then going by phone and, and talking about what God has shown us. And, and I got all excited and I told her about this. Jesus stepped into the boat. He went across the town and healed this uh, lame, this crippled man. And at the end, he said to the paralytic, get up, take up your mat and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. You see, there's something that shifted when Jesus came and when the kingdom of God came. The authority of heaven has been invested in the Son of God and now in the people of God. Can we get a hold of that? Jesus said one time, he said, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And uh, this is a little scary for me because I'm kind of a... I'm kind of a laid-back guy. I don't engage the culture very well. I, I'm, I'm still kind of a farm kid. I'd rather hide out on the back 40, but God has called us to more than that. God has called us to operate in the authority, not in apathy or fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We need to move, in that moment, we need to move from apathy to authority. Talk very briefly about the miracle. This miracle was faith in action. Peter went to the man. He said, look at us. The man fixed his gaze on him, and then it says he took him by the right hand, and he lifted him up and said, rise up and walk. That's the part that gets me. I'm real good at shaking people's hands in church, saying, hey, I'll be praying for you as they're walking away out the door. I'll be praying for you. And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. I'll be honest. It's just kind of one of those bylines that we use in the church. It sounds spiritual to say we're going to pray for somebody. How about we start right on the spot, and some folks are great at this, and I want to get better at right on the spot saying, can I pray with you? You'll scare some people half to death. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun to hear the reaction. Very seldom will you have someone say, no, I don't think so. Uh, I did have one guy tell me, don't waste your time one time. I remember that very vividly. So I kind of, this is a scary territory. But how about if we as the people of God be like Peter and start operating in the authority of God and saying, rise up and walk. Can I pray with you now? Because the God I serve is bigger than whatever you're facing or whatever I'm facing. Let's be people of confidence and boldness. This miracle was faith in action. It was verifiable and undeniable. It says in 4 verses 14 to 16, and I'm going to get ahead of, and I'm going to steal some of Allie's thunder for next week. Uh, 4 verse 14, if I can find it. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. You realize when God does a miracle, it shuts everybody up. Miracles are God's way of saying, checkmate. <laughs> the old devil, <laughs> it's over. It's over. I've won. Jesus Christ is the victor. Jesus Christ is the conqueror. And we are operating in his power and his authority. That's what miracles are. And I'm going to push in just a little bit here. You might not like this, but 
this is something I want you to write down and take home with you. A church that sings about the sweet by and by while denying the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in the here and now is not a credible witness to the resurrection. We used to sing lots of heaven songs. That's all good. I'll fly away, oh glory. I love to sing those songs. But Jesus has called us to the here and now with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's, how, that's why miracles validate the resurrection. These signs will follow them that believe, Jesus said. In my name they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will heal the sick. All of these things will happen because Jesus Christ says, I have gone to the Father and I'm leaving you the power of the Holy Spirit. This is heavy stuff, but it's the word of God. And I want us to grab a hold of it and soak it in. Finally, the mess, the moment, the miracle. I want to talk for a few minutes about the message. Peter saw opportunity. It says in verse 11, while the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. So the first thing Peter did in his message as he saw this opportunity to speak, he redirected the focus from the miracle and the, and the vessel to the power, to the man Jesus Christ. This would have been an awesome opportunity for Peter and John uh, to say, hey, man, look what we've done. Let's start a church. <laughs> Let's take up an offering. Look at what, look, send in that money. No. They took the attention away from themselves. He says, why are you looking at us? This is because of Jesus Christ. And then he got real personal. I love Peter's boldness, this guy that, couldn't wait to deny Jesus a few weeks before, he started confronting the crowd of hypocrites. And I want to just say this morning that confrontation is not a bad word. I love preaching about grace and about God's favor. But there's a reason that God's favor is necessary. I know that the world knows that it's condemned already. Jesus said that. I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might have life. But there is a time and a place for the Holy Spirit to call out the reality of sin and of judgment. And Peter didn't back away from that at, that, at this moment in time. In fact, he got really personal with these people. Listen to what he said, and I won't, I won't read all of it, but three times he said, you did this. You did this. In verse 13, 14, and 15, he said, You, uh, this is uh, because of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. And this one was the big one, 15. You killed the author of life. Would you go to a church every Sunday if the preacher preached like that? You killed the author of life. <laughs> Get off on a side trail here. You know, church seeker sensitive, you, you know what that all about. Church is becoming seeker, seeker sensitive. Uh, we want to be friendly and, and entice the crowds in. I don't see that in the book of Acts. I don't see, uh, I, I love welcoming tables and guest tables and all that and coffee cups. I, I love it all. But can you imagine if the Acts church had offered coffee cups. You know what would have said on them? Thinking about the story of Ananias and Sapphira, getting ahead of myself a little bit. Come to Acts 2 assembly. You lie, you fry. <laughs> <laughs> New logo for the church. I don't know. <laughs> Seriously, think about it for a moment. Sin is real. And if we sidestep it in our own lives or in the lives around us, we miss the opportunity for repentance. And revival only comes when we're willing to humble ourselves and repent. And that's the next place that Peter went. He called the people to repentance. In about verse uh, 17, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. 
But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So there's redirecting the focus he confronted the people, he called them to repentance, and then he gave the promise of refreshing and restoration. In a dry and thirsty land and culture in which we live, can we begin offering a cup of water of God's grace and his restoration and his refreshing that he gives to all? Church, I'm going to leave you with this closing challenge today. Three things. We need to rediscover our authority. We need to understand that we have been authorized to preach in the name of Jesus and to heal in the name of Jesus and to lift people up in the name of Jesus. And my challenge to you this week is to dig into Scripture and find all the verses. I thought about looking them all up and giving them to you, and I thought, no, I want you to dig these out for yourselves. I want you this week to start digging out some scriptures that talk about the authority of the New Testament believer. The kingdom of God is here. Acts is being written right now. We're not talking about the sweet by and by anymore, folks. We're talking about the Holy Spirit and the here and the now. That's what the book of Acts is all about. So I challenge you, as the praise team comes and gets into place, to rediscover your authority, that you will understand who you are in Christ, and what he has called you to do. Then I, I want to also challenge you to recognize Holy Spirit moments. I'm going to simplify this for you just a little bit because this can seem kind of heavy. You realize that Peter and John had probably passed this lame beggar many, many times before. They went to the house of prayer every day, the Bible says. And this was the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. They were going, they probably had passed this beggar every day for a long time. What I'm trying to say is that not when, every need around us is not an automatic call for you to do something. We'd be worn out if that was the case. But when there's a Holy Spirit moment, you all know what those are. When the Holy Spirit urges you, when he calls someone out or this face comes to you in the middle of the night, what are we going to do with those moments? That's what I'm talking about, recognizing those Holy Spirit moments, not being uh, drowned in a sea of need because it's everywhere, but to understand those Holy Spirit moments when they come and one by one we begin to act in faith and act in boldness and act in courage. So rediscover our authority, recognize Holy Spirit moments, and then last, fire up the combine. <laughs> it's time, you know, we can talk about the harvest and that's okay. We can prepare for the harvest, and that's okay. But at some point, we've got to get out of the coffee shop and into the cornfield. We've got to quit talking about it. We've got to quit singing about it. We've got to talk, uh, quit preparing for it, and we've got to go out and do it, whether it's the middle of the night, when the ground is frozen, whenever it is, we've got to catch the urgency of the moment and realize that God's kingdom is coming, and there are people who are lost and dying around us, dying for hope, dying for refreshing. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, says, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And then he says this, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We're not doing this alone, folks. He's promised to be with us every step of the way. And when we step out in faith, he'll meet us in that place. As the praise team sings this song of worship, uh, I want to encourage you, if you'd like to uh, take communion, there'll be elders there to serve communion. If you'd like to have prayer, uh, the prayer room is available. But this morning, I just sensed that the Holy Spirit, all week, I believe that the Holy Spirit was calling uh, me to ask people that have genuine needs they may not seem significant to other people, but to you, they're huge. 
And I want to just invite you to stand where you are during this worship time. I'd like to ever, everyone else to stay seated. We're going to worship in our seats now. But if you have a specific need that you want to just stand up in faith and say, Hey, I'm a beggar. I need help. Would you be willing to take the courage to stand? And then if you are a believer and you look around and see people standing, I want you to gather around them during, while we're worshiping and just lay hands on them and begin to impart the blessing of the Holy Spirit on one another. Can we do that during our prayer time today?